technology is going to be an asset towards an objective. But where I place my faith in are the people that begin to see the importance of addressing it. It is not doing one thing that affects the climate change or not. Obviously, we as human beings are beginning to consume a lot of resources at a much higher rate. But it is not only creating new sources of energy to offset it, it is also how do you bring about efficiencies in what you do. There are lots of pathways for those of us who have homes or businesses to approach energy efficiency, to put in electric heat pumps, make sure that our windows are as efficient as possible. So a lot of this work we can also do with energy efficiency, which doesn't actually require development of more renewable energy. We have been doing a really good job of individually reducing our per capita use of energy. And that's because we've been doing a lot of energy efficiency projects. So we're putting in insulation in our walls, we're putting in new windows, we're weather stripping our doors. And so we're doing all those weatherization things and we're building new buildings that are substantially better energy-wise than the ones that were built 1990 and before. We have to go back and retrofit all those, but the new ones are very efficient. Making sure that we do all those cost-effective energy efficiency measures that we can do, putting in LED lights, energy efficient appliances, all those things really help create a system that works better achieves our greenhouse gas goals and keeps costs as low as possible. Energy efficiency for the longest time and still is, was the least environmentally impactful resource, but also the least cost. It actually was one of the only things that utilities can do that actually lowered people's cost. Everything else we do raises people's costs. Energy efficiency also means that if you're using less energy, you don't have to build as many transmission lines. You can add capacity by having less energy used. For a long time, we have operated what utilities call demand-side management programs. And these are mostly various kinds of technologies and programs to help customers use energy more efficiently. More efficient appliances, particularly in energy-intensive operations, air conditioning systems, principally, refrigeration, large appliances like washers and dryers. If those operations are using less energy, that is capacity that we can use somewhere else. We actually provide cash incentives to help customers purchase those devices. Another area that we worked on is uh, efficient irrigation systems. You know, again, incentives to upgrade to uh, more modern, mostly electric motors for pumping of water. Uh, but also we have worked with heavy industry on interruption contracts for a break on the power rate that they pay, they agree to certain interruption parameters. So if we're faced with a problem on our system or a huge spike in demand, we can go to that customer and say, we need to take advantage of your interruption parameters. And so if you'll shut down a certain amount of your operation, that's capacity that we can then use elsewhere to deal with the dynamic ebb and flow of customer demand across our system. PGE has a demand reduction program where they actually pay people to stand by and they pay them on a monthly basis and they pay them to stand by in case they need them to drop load. And then they've signed up that if PGE says, we need you to drop load, they'll drop you know, half their load and they'll shut off all this stuff. That's way cheaper than building a peaking plant for that particular time or going out onto the market when everybody else is on the market and the price went up. It's really expensive to do that. So being able to manage that demand with computers to control the equipment is already valuable. And we do it quite often. Uh, and we're going to do more of it. And people can opt out if they want to. Here's a high-end uh, heat exchanger, and so we don't have a furnace. Uh, we, d we just use this thing, which is pretty efficient at turning electricity into heat in the house. Yes, efficiency is a good thing, but it's a two-edged sword. And I'm sure lots of people you've interviewed are going to talk about efficiency. William Stanley Jevons is one of my heroes. He was a polymath, a very smart guy. Queen Victoria's advisors say, you know, the coal is all around us all the time. What's happening? I think we need to understand this. So they said, who's the smartest guy around? And they went to Jevons. 
And they said, uh, Stanley, here's a grant for two years. Go find out about coal. So he said, okay. He wrote this all up in a book called The Coal Question. All economic activity goes back to coal. He goes through all kinds of examples, fisheries and, and farming, and it all went back to coal. He was amazed at that. And so England's using a lot of coal. How much coal are they using? Well, he plotted it, and it seemed to be growing exponentially. Okay, England's been here a long time. How long will the coal last? And he said, well, no more than 200 years, and less if we keep growing exponentially. We've got to build more efficient engines, use that coal more efficiently. So he goes to the Royal Library and looks things up, and he founds out that there had been three previous studies similar to him on the Savary engine, the New Coleman engine, the earlier steam engine, before the Watt steam engine. And they all concluded the same thing. We needed to make our engines more efficient. And they did. And the Watt engine was much more efficient. But it made it cheaper. And by making it cheaper, people found more uses for it. And it actually contributed to the increase in the use of coal. And this Jevons paradox comes up again and again. In the 1970s, when smaller Japanese cars came into the U.S., we doubled our fuel efficiency and people drove the cars twice as much. We make refrigerators more efficient so they, they're bigger. We've made lighting more efficient so people use more of it. I guess the ultimate example is some big billboard in Las Vegas. Jevons' paradox doesn't always happen, but it often or mostly happens. So it's good to be more efficient, but you have to cap the use. You have to talk about the total use first. One of the things that I would observe, though, in our company's experience is that the advances in lighting efficiency, the move from incandescent lighting to compact fluorescence to LEDs, a huge energy saver because the light output has remained essentially the same, the amount of electricity consumed is significantly less. So even though people are using more lighting than they might otherwise have, uh, the overall demand from lighting systems has really gone down. People could do what's called take back. When their bill goes down because they got a more energy efficient house, they turn it from 68 to 70 and they use more energy. But the net effect overall is that the energy efficiency saves a lot of energy and we use a lot less energy. But also the quality of life is an important factor. Energy is a means to an end, right? So it's what we're using it for. So quality of life is actually a big important part of what's happening in that paradigm as well.